Too many times throughout history have the contributions of women gone ignored, forgotten, or accredited to another, typically a man, in their respective fields. Too often has it been the case that women have been considered incapable of having intellectual thought and therefore have not received recognition for their work because of it. Now we live in a time where, although modern women are credited and praised for their accomplishments much more frequently than women of the past, we still often avoid discussing the contributions of women throughout broader history. This is especially true in modern academia. Why is this the case when there are hundreds of thousands of academic resources out there to affirm these women's stories and award them proper recognition? In honor of Women's History Month, today I'm going to be talking about the accomplishments of one particularly remarkable woman in the field of sociology. This is the story of a woman who unfortunately has also had her academic achievements and contributions ignored or attributed to her male peers, as too often the story goes for women such as herself. This woman made significant contributions to the methodologies that are used today in modern sociological research, which have been adapted for research in many other fields as well. Today, I will be telling you the story of Harriet Martineau, the forgotten sociologist. Before this video starts, I wanted to note that all the sources I used to gather my information will be linked below in the description. This video will also be composed of three main parts. The first will briefly summarize Harriet Martineau's life, the second will discuss her contributions to academic research, and the final part will explain the importance and significance of acknowledging Martineau's work alongside many other important women throughout history. If you would like to skip to a certain part of the video, you should be able to do so by clicking on a chapter divider within the video or by clicking on the video markers in the description down below. I also wanted to thank Professor JDR for allowing me to make last minute changes to my project and do this video instead of the plans I initially had for my final, as I really wanted to make this video for Women's History Month, but I would have been otherwise unable to do so with the demands of my other classes, so again I just wanted to thank him for that. I also wanted to thank him for being one of the first of my sociology professors to tell me about this important historical figure who has too often been ignored, and for encouraging discussions about the ways in which the contributions of women throughout history are frequently frequently ignored or forgotten in academia. Now with that being said, let's get into the video. We will begin with a very brief overview of Harriet Martineau's life. So who was she? Harriet Martineau was born on June 12, 1802 in Norwich, England. She was the daughter of Elizabeth and Thomas Martineau, who was a textile manufacturer. She grew up in a middle-class household alongside three sisters and four brothers. Harriet's parents held progressive views regarding the education of girls, and so the Martineau daughters received an education at home. This is because girls during the time period were typically denied the opportunity to receive a formal education. In 1813, Harriet was able to attend a school directed by Reverend Isaac Perry, where she learned French, Latin, and English. In 1815, however, Harriet left the school since Reverend Isaac Perry had moved away. Despite leaving school, she continued her studies on her own at home with some help from her parents and her older brothers. Martineau's childhood was marked with frequent illness, which would be something that would continue to affect her for the rest of her life. She also suffered from a hearing impairment that first presented itself during her initial school years. Her deafness would be something that would also significantly worsen as she got older. Later in life, Martineau wrote about these experiences in her works Letter to the Deaf in 1834, Life in the Sick Room in 1844, as well as in her autobiography, which was published in 1877. But back to Martineau's upbringing. It was in 1817 that her parents sent her to Bristol to live with her uncle due to reasons relating to her poor health. Although Martineau's initial writings later in life were very religious, it was during this time with her uncle that she began to read more philosophical works. Her understandings of these works would come to significantly alter her views on religion as she got older, which would then become reflected in her later writings. In 1825, the Martineau family suffered from great financial difficulties resulting from the Panic of 1825, which was an economic crisis relating to a stock market crash that had happened in England. Shortly after this, in 1826, Harriet's father passed away, leaving Harriet to support herself. Harriet would then become engaged to someone named John Worthington, a man who had gone to school with one of her brothers. However, this engagement was short-lived as Worthington became ill and passed away before the two could wed. Harriet Martineau would never marry during her lifetime. Now truly left to support herself, Harriet turned to writing as one way of earning income in addition to some needlework. At first she wrote short stories, but Martineau soon became recognized as a respected author through her writings about economics. One of her most popular pieces she wrote in this topic was a series called Illustrations of Political Economy, which were published between 1832 and 1834. Her goal of these pieces was to make understanding economics easier for the general public. After gaining some financial stability through her works in economics, Harriet Martineau decided to travel to the United States. She was particularly interested in the abolitionist movement. 
It was on this trip that she would craft and record empirically oriented methods of ethnographic observation, methods that are still used today in much of academic research. In 1837, Martineau published what she observed using these methods in a piece titled Society in America. Through this work, Martineau expressed a critical perspective on the way the United States prided itself on democracy, yet simultaneously excluded women and Black people from being able to participate in the democratic process. She also criticized the ways in which women were taught and expected to fulfill submissive roles in society. Shortly after this, Martineau outlined the methods she used to reach her conclusions in a piece titled How to Observe Morals and Manners, which was published in 1838. This piece was significant as it is one of the first known guides for how to conduct systematic observations of people. The years that followed for Martineau would be marked by significant struggles with illness once again. For years, Martineau suffered from a prolapsed uterus and an ovarian cyst that she initially thought would kill her. Being unable to leave her home for much of this time, she wrote about her experiences with her illness and how society tends to undermine the abilities of sick and disabled people. It was during this time that she wrote Life in the Sick Room, which she published in 1844. However, she would return to writing for profit after miraculously claiming to have been cured by mesmerism. Some years later, in 1853, Harriet Martineau published The Positive Philosophy of Auguste Comte, which gained wide recognition for being a successful translation and interpretation of Auguste Comte's, and I do apologize, I'm definitely going to butcher this pronunciation, Cru de Philosophie Positive. Her version was much more condensed than Comte's initial work. Comte himself even remarked how he thought Martineau's version was better written than his own. Despite her brilliant other published writings, this piece would become what Martineau is typically most well known for during her career. In 1855, Martineau began to struggle with illness once again. In anticipating death this time, she decided to write her autobiography. However, it wouldn't be published until over two decades later after she died in June of 1876. While doctors initially believed that Martineau had passed away due to heart disease, an autopsy would later reveal that she had actually died due to complications relating to an ovarian cyst, something that Martineau previously thought she had been cured of through mesmerism. Martineau was buried alongside her mother in Birmingham, where she rests to this day. Now that we know a little bit about Harriet Martineau, what was her role in developing the field of sociology? Harriet Martineau is widely regarded as the mother of sociology. She wanted to make connections between social institutions and individual people, which is essentially what the field of sociology is. The methods she outlined in How to Observe Morals and Manners in 1838 was one of the first known guides for conducting systematic ethnographic observations of people. She also addressed the importance of acknowledging personal bias and the role of the researcher when interpreting data. Another notable characteristic of Martineau's research methods is that she was one of the first sociologists to recognize the importance of studying objects and architecture, and not just people, in order to better understand a society. Unfortunately, the popularization of these methods and considerations are often accredited to male anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski rather than Martineau, who was born a decade after Martineau had died. Furthermore, Martineau's translation and condensation of Auguste Comte's ideas in The Positive Philosophy of Auguste Comte, which she published in 1853, is largely responsible for popularizing some of Comte's philosophies and making them more accessible for a broader audience. Despite this fact, Martineau's name is often excluded from discussions of the founders of sociology, whereas Comte's name is almost always mentioned. Martineau's writing in Society in America, which she published in 1837, also provided significant contributions in regard to feminist theory within sociology. She made important arguments about how the submissive role of women in society is something that is socially taught and reproduced rather than something that is biologically innate. She argued that the allocation of the private sphere of society to women and the public sphere to men, such as through restricting a woman's access to education and work outside of the home, was actually a form of social control in order for men to reinforce their ownership and dominance over women. In addition to petitioning for women's right to vote during this time, Martineau also campaigned against laws that targeted sex workers. In her later writings about her struggles with illness, Martineau made further connections between gender and health. Martineau argued that women are placed into a position where physical illness is often associated with their perceived biological inferiority. For example, say you are a woman who's crying because you're suffering from really severe physical pain. However, the doctor assumes you're crying not because the pain is severe, but because you are a woman and it is therefore in your
your nature to be excessively emotional. Martineau also argued that women are positioned so that any deviance from gender roles is attributed to some sort of mental illness, such as hysteria. This, according to Martineau, results in the specific healthcare needs of women becoming oversimplified, overlooked, or simply dismissed on the basis of gender differences. In addition to her arguments about the relationship between gender and health, Martineau further emphasized the importance of viewing chronically ill and disabled people as more than just their illness or disability. In what was referred to at the time as being an invalid, Martineau advocated for the recognition of intellectual ability among invalids. As someone who was considered an invalid herself, she argued that invalids have certain knowledge about their illness or disability because of their own experience with their illness or disability. Because of this, Martineau argued that the invalid should be able to make decisions about their own treatment in regard to their health care. She also highlighted how the tendency for the intellectual ability of an invalid to be dismissed is more problematic when the invalid is a woman as again, women of this time were basically thought to be incapable of having any intellectual thought. Even more, Martineau was a large advocate for the abolition of slavery. It was within this topic that she developed her concept of an anomaly, which is a social, political, or legal institution that is formally a part of a legal rational structure, but one that is in direct contradiction or incompatible with the underlying principles of that structure. According to Martineau, the underlying principles of the legal rational structure of the United States, that is to say, American democracy, surrounds the idea that all men are created equal. However, an institution such as slavery that functions primarily on the basis of inequality directly contradicts this principle of equality. Slavery would be an example of an anomaly within American society. Another anomaly of American society that Martineau highlights is the inability of certain members of society to vote in a society whose system of government rests upon the consent of the governed. Martineau questioned how the power of the government could truly come from the people of America if a large portion of citizens could not vote, such as free black folks, slaves, and women. This is just a broad overview of some of Martineau's contributions to sociology. She's also wrote several other works regarding religion, suicide, death, education, family, domestic relations, delinquency, crime, and so much more. The connection she made between broader institutions and society and individuals living within that society are especially important within the field of sociology, and Martineau was among the first sociologists to be making these types of connections. Martineau's methods of observations and analysis are the beginnings of what would become the field of sociology. Many of her methods are regularly practiced today and are held to high standards in academic research, even in related fields such as anthropology and social psychology. During her lifetime, Harriet Martineau wrote over 30 books and published more than 2,000 articles. She remains an icon as someone who broke from traditional expectations for women during her time. Despite this success, her career and contributions to sociology often go unrecognized or minimally acknowledged. Many of her male peers criticize her ideas for being oversimplistic despite them being anything but, and some claim that Martineau was arrogant because of her assertiveness when her male peers did not receive the same type of treatment. Here are just a few quotes from her patriarchal critics. She was far too self-centered to have made another person happy, says an unnamed biographer in regard to her unmarried status when the same would rarely be said about an unmarried male academic. Another unnamed biographer states, Miss Martineau's style was admirably adapted to the task, whatever the deficiencies of her mind, when discussing her translation of Comte's work in the positive philosophy of Auguste Comte. The deficiencies of her mind, of course, being related to the fact that she is a woman. Harriet Martineau is one of the finest examples of a masculine intellect in a female form which have distinguished the present age, remarked William Howitt, because, you know, intellectual thought is inherently a feature of men and it's so crazy that a woman would be capable of critical thinking skills. Even today, Martineau is often underrepresented in the field of sociology despite being considered a founder of it. I'm a criminology major which branches off of sociology, and even in my own academic studies, I have never heard of Martineau until I took a sociological classics course. Although women sociologists are seeing more representation in academic articles and textbooks, the ways they are represented tend to be problematic as they tend to minimize the significance of their work. When we look at modern discussions and representations of women in sociology, there are three main ways you can categorize the problematic representation of these women in the teachings of sociology. The first is inclusion sexist style, which is basically the idea of out a woman, any woman. The women represented in this category are either not sociologists or are wrongfully credited for the ideas or works of earlier women sociologists. The second category is token measures, which is only including the ideas of women sociologists in lists or tables, treating their work as isolated ideas rather than as important contributions to broader concepts. The last category is gender only, which only discusses and summarizes the work of women in one section and typically one about feminism. 
Why does this even matter? Well, to quote Lynn McDonald, the omission of women theorists distorts the literature and misinforms students, as well as harming the careers and reputations of the women who did good work. Students learn that the major contributors, indeed the only contributors in early theory, were men when this is simply not so. Women's contributions date back to the emergence of science in the 17th century in the Enlightenment, not merely to the late 20th century as it would appear from so many theory textbooks currently in use. It's important that we not only represent the work and contributions of women throughout history, but properly represent them and credit them. Like Lynn MacDonald said, acknowledging the work of women is essential to the accuracy of the history we're teaching. It's also necessary to have proper representation so as to affirm the importance of having women in these fields. It shows young women aspiring to find a career in their respective fields that they do in fact belong and that they do have a place and that they can find success. You don't have to search far to see the accounts of thousands of women complaining about or even dropping their STEM majors because of being among the only women in their courses and the consequences that follow that experience misogyny without I was a woman in STEM. Yikes. Of course, sociology certainly isn't computer science or engineering, but it goes to show how significant it is to have women properly represented and recognized for the work they contribute to their field. Harriet Martineau was an incredible woman. She continually advocated for herself and others throughout her life, even when she was struggling with her own physical health. Her resilience is quite honestly inspiring. In Martineau's work, she expresses progressive ideas in such articulate and thoughtful ways. She's courageous and daring in that she was willing to challenge the status quo, not just in her writings, but also in her way of living. She was an independent, educated woman who broke away from traditional gender roles by financially supporting herself and finding success even without marriage. Martineau not only made important contributions to first wave feminism and abolitionist movements during her time, but she also helped found a lot of the modern research practices within many social science fields today and not just sociology. I really hope that this video reaches other students who may have had their education affected by Martineau in some sort of way, even if she may not have been credited for it. Maybe you've heard of Martineau before, maybe you haven't, maybe you're a student, maybe you're not. Regardless of why you're here, I'm really glad that I was able to share with you the incredible story of this too often forgotten sociologist. I want to wish everyone a happy Women's History Month and thank you so much for watching this video this month and really at all times of the year. I really encourage you guys to go out and seek the stories of these women that have been forgotten or ignored and try to share those stories. And feel free to share this video as well if you want to help spread awareness about Harriet Martineau as well as her contributions to sociology and academic research in general. Although this video was for a school project, I actually did have a lot of fun making it and I really enjoyed what I learned through my research. Now, even though this isn't my tip type of video, I would be interested in making something like this again if this is something you guys are also interested in. So let me know in the comments down below. And if so, also let me know which forgotten historical figures you think deserve some recognition. Anyway, that is all I have for this video. Thank you guys again so much for watching. And also thank you again to Professor JDR for letting me do this video for my project. If you would like to check out more content from me, feel free to subscribe or just check out my channel. But like I said, a lot of my content is not like this. But again, if you want to see more content like this, let me know. Once again, happy Women's History Month to all you wonderful ladies out there, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!